Um, before we start and before I introduce my remarkable guest, um, I just, I want to say a few things, you know, we are all, we're all sheltering in place. Our hearts go out to the incredible nurses and doctors and all the healthcare workers that are being so generous and so brave on the front lines and all the workers that are, they don't know what they're going to do because they're out of work and, and our hearts go out to them and, and we wish them all the best and we hope that this will be over soon. And it will be over soon, this pandemic, but the climate crisis will not be over. The climate crisis is here, but it's going to get much worse. Even if we manage to do all the right things, it's going to get worse because the fossil fuel industry lied to us. And as a result, we didn't start phasing out fossil fuels soon enough. So we have a very small window of opportunity to do what the scientists tell us we have to do in order to assure a livable future for our children. And that is to, to cut our fossil fuel emissions in half. Okay, well right now, because of this, this pandemic, the government is doing what they said to us, oh, we can't possibly fund the Green New Deal. We can't possibly do what you all are asking for to transition to clean and sustainable energy future. We just don't have that kind of money. Well, they do. And we're seeing it now. And we're happy that we're seeing it because small businesses and workers and the most vulnerable people in this country have to be helped to be able to survive and make it out the other side of this. But what we have to remember, as I said, the, this pandemic is going to go away. If we, in the bailout, these trillions and trillions of dollars that we're putting out, if we use that to bolster big companies, especially the foster, fossil fuel industry, we're going to lock ourselves into a situation where there's no hope of pulling back. We have such a small time, nine and a half years. So we have to demand that money also goes to the clean renewable energy sector, solar, wind. There are over 2 million workers in that economic se sector. They have to be taken care of too. So please, I, I want you to join us in the efforts that we're, that we're doing to, to, to force elected officials in Congress to help the renewable energy sector and to not give money to fossil fuels. And we're gonna tell you later the kinds of things you can do, okay? So now I wanna introduce our guest. Nancy McLean is an historian, a professor of history and policy at Duke University whose research focuses on race, gender, labor history, and social movements with particular attention to the American South. Just about three years ago, her seminal book was published, and I know that some of you have read it, Democracy in Chains, the deep history of the radical right, rights stealth plan for America. It is a must read for right now. Welcome, Nancy. It's just an honor to have you join us. I'm so grateful. And your book is so critical to help us understand what is happening right now, why the Trump administration is doing what they're doing. Um, I also, I wanted, I just want to remind everybody, um, we're going to, Nancy and I are going to talk for about 30 minutes, and then we're going to have about 30 minutes of questions from the audience. Um, so if you're on Zoom with us or watching via Facebook Live, please write your questions in the chat or comments, and, and we'll get to as many of them as we can, okay? So Nancy, welcome. And I'd like to start with you giving us a, a brief summary of what your book reveals and how it applies to today. Thank you, Jane. And I just want to say I am so honored and pleased to be here. You have been such a model to me and to so many of us through the years with your history of commitment and activism and being on the front lines. And I'm also thrilled to be here with Greenpeace, which is doing such critical work in the United States and around the world. And it's just amazing to look at the listing of who's on and all the different countries they're from. I'm actually getting chills as I say it. So it is great to be with you. Uh, unfortunately, we're here at a time that is both terrifying 
horrifying and perplexing. And I guess the easiest way to summarize my book is to say that it provides an explanatory backstory of how we came to this moment. You know, and our country right now seems so broken and, 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 inexplicable, that I think it's helpful to remember that there was a time when American productive capacity and American workers helped win the war against fascism in World War II. We put the first person on the moon. Our scientists and technological uh, uh, innovators created the internet. And yet we're at a moment now when our federal government is utterly incompetent in the face of its biggest challenge, where health workers of all kinds, grocery workers, all of our workers can't even get simple protective equipment, let alone test to understand who has this terrible virus and who doesn't. So my book is not about this crisis per se, but I think it does help to make sense of the puzzle of how we reached such a, a perplexing nadir in our national history. Uh, and in short, it is the story of how a wealthy donor network led by Charles Koch, that now includes many, many other uh, billionaires and multimillionaires, many from the fossil fuel industry happened on a set of ideas that enabled them to make their money effective in trying to shackle our democracy so that we cannot do things that the majority of the people want to do. And just this past year, Charles Koch boasted at a donor network summit, he said, we have made more progress together in the past five years, that is, including the Trump administration, than I had been able to make in the previous 50. So my book tells the story of the set of ideas uh, that Charles Koch has weaponized and these various organizations on the radical right have weaponized in order to take a minority cause and enable it to undermine effective government for the rest of us. Um, so we can get into more of the details of that as we talk, but I think that's probably uh, the simplest way to express it. And maybe one measure, I'll just add one measure of the power of these ideas that they're using to change incentives and punishments in the 1990s, there was no difference between the two major parties in America on the science of climate change. George Herbert Walker Bush recognized it, as did Democrats. Now, clearly, they would have had different policies, but there was no dispute about the science. By 2013, thanks to the tactics of this uh, donor network built by Charles Koch and the organizations they work with, only eight of 278 Republicans in Congress would admit that the climate uh, threat is man-made and real and needs action. So that is a measure of the effectiveness of this donor network using these ideas that I describe in Democracy in Chains. These rollbacks, these, this inability to get equipment to people, this, this saying the federal government is just a backup, um, mm -hmm is interesting because in your book you say, um, you know, that people might view this as incompetence or, you know, a, 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 a super example of, of partisanship, but it's really deliberate. It's very deliberate. And in, in your book you say, um, you quote someone saying, people will be expected to fend for themselves much more than they do now. And others will fall by the wayside. Just we don't really care. And that's quite clear right now. So why do you think, um, why do they think it's good for people having to care, take care of themselves rather than working for the good of all? Yes, it took me a long time to understand this because these ideas are so marginal to most of us in their pure form and, and, and their marginality is the reason that the Koch network operations have had to rely on stealth because basically hard libertarianism says that government should only have three functions to provide for the national defense, to preserve the role of rule of law, and to guarantee social order. As one radio talk show host summarized back to me, that means armies, courts, and police. Beyond that, they don't believe the government has any right to do anything, that it's an infringement on liberty. So these are folks who don't have never supported Social Security. They don't support Medicare. They opposed anti-discrimination legislation. They fought the environmental movement. And because their ideas are so unpopular, they have relied on misinformation and systematic disinformation uh, to get the power that they have. And that's most obvious with uh, climate change and climate science denial 
violent attacks on climate scientists, but they were also practicing, you could say, with tobacco and defending the tobacco industry uh, in the 1990s. So basically, you know, some of us, when we think about libertarian, it seems like, well, that sounds right. You know, why should people get busted for smoking pot? Or, you know, why should we be sending armies to countries that, that never caused any, any threat to us? You know, so there's a way in which there, there's a popular version of these ideas that makes sense and is appealing. But if you look at the entire libertarian apparatus now, and it's literally hundreds of organizations funded by these, these donors, uh, what they really believe in is economic liberty. They believe in a kind of what I call property supremacy, or we might call corporate supremacy, but basically to say that modern democracy infringes on the liberty of those with wealth and power that they see as the productive uh, citizens and uh, interferes with their liberty and unfairly shifts resources from those folks to the rest of us. Uh, you know, when I try to, when I think about these ideas, I think of the Billie Hol Holiday lyric, them that's got shall have, them that's not shall lose. Um, and that's really what this is about. Now, those are not popular ideas and they were never able to persuade more than one or 2% of the population to support those ideas uh, so in their, their, their pure form. So Charles Koch went looking for what he called a technology to implement these ideas without letting the people know that's what's happening. So that's what we're seeing uh, with voter suppression, with gerrymandering, with the smashing up of unions, et cetera. But behind it all, as you suggest, Jane, is a social Darwinist ideology, an ideology that says some of us matter, and some of us don't. And that quote that you read was so chilling to me when I came across it. And another part of it is, and I actually have my book open to the page, uh, this individual said that um, uh, not only will others fall by the wayside in this new world, but that it will be easier to ignore those who are left behind. So when I put that together too, with thinking about what um, the, the fossil fuel industry uh, and the Charles Koch foundations alone are doing, and by Greenpeace counts, they have given over 100, Charles Koch has given more than 127 million to climate science denial. When I put that together with these ideas, I get this chilling realization that they are ruining our planet and they are trying to make us not care about the people who are going to absorb the brunt of that, who will yeah. be particularly black and brown peoples, island peoples, people in less wealthy countries, uh, people in our rural communities. So, you know, as, as Greta Thunberg said, and as you have been saying, our planet is on fire and we need to understand these ideas and fight the people backing them. Yeah, they've, they've seized the narrative much more effectively than progressive ha uh, have, um, you know, all those people in the middle of the country that are suffering so much, these um, corporate libertarians say, uh, yeah, if you're suffering, it's because immigrants took your jobs. You know, they, they're very good at pointing the finger and, and, and claiming the narrative than, than we have been. And we can see, I mean, under the radar for decades, the Coke money and the Mercer money and other of these um, billionaires have been winning over state legislatures. And we're seeing now what that means. <laughs> you know, in Wisconsin, the fact that the state legislature overruled the governor and said, no, we have to go ahead with the elections. This is playing out in real time right now. And it, it matters in terms of whether we're gonna salvage our democracy, not to mention our lives, right? Yes, I could not agree with you more. We are at an existential moment for our planet, but we are also at an existential moment for democracy. And you're absolutely right, Jane. If you want to see the future, if this cause is not stopped, you can look to red states like my North Carolina, which was a laboratory for this cause, as was Wisconsin, as you mentioned, where I went to graduate school. It was so uncanny when Scott Walker came to power there and I just moved to North Carolina and all these things were unfurling here. And now what we see with these, and I, I hesitate even to call them Republican, because I don't think people understand how much the, the uh, Coke donor network has kind of taken over uh, the Republican Party by changing the incentives of donors, primary challenges, etc., and turned it into a delivery vehicle. So now we have this deadly dogma and the pressure of the donors driving people, uh, governors and, and people in, in, in power to do things that are literally deadly 
for the people who vote for them, right? It is, if you look at the governors who have refused to, to uh, declare stay at home orders, they are to a person, Republican governors. They are standard bearers of this crazy cause um, and they are endangering their own people. I mean, even Donald Trump's telling people they can go back to, to church on Easter. You know, of course, evangelical, white evangelicals have, have voted significantly for him, but he's endangering the very people who put him in office with that. So it is just uh, crazy, but they do have a narrative, as you suggest. They have a story that works with their people, and they are also creating a situation by their actions that has led to the polarization that we see now. And I have to say, as I was writing this book, you know, in 2013, 2014, 2015, even before the 2016 election, I thought, what is the matter with these people? Do they not understand history? When you paralyze liberal democracy, when you make government unable to respond to the will of the people and they are suffering, they don't just go to sleep. They polarize. They go right or they go left. We saw this between World War I and World War II in the polarization between fascism and communism. So I thought, my gosh, that's what we're going to get if they keep this up. And it didn't even take that long. You know, 2016, before the book was out, Donald Trump, the candidate of the right, this right-wing populism spreading in other parts of the world uh, that people on the, the call um, could speak to. Uh, and also, though, uh, Bernie Sanders becoming the most popular and trusted uh, person, uh, political figure in America on the Democratic side uh, for a time. So really, that polarization, that sense that something radical has got to happen. So if we do not reclaim our democracy and make it functional, we're going to be, not only is our planet going to be in danger, but we're all going to be uh, in, in, in danger in so many different ways as this, this virus um, illustrates. And I think maybe I always look for the hope, but I think this is kind of our wake up call, right? We still have that nine and a half years to deal with the threat to the planet. We're rediscovering that we are connected. We're all in this together. So maybe this can be the moment when we, uh, when we really begin to set things right. From your mouth to God's ear. <laughs> Your book awakened me to the to the real truth that if they win the next election, mm -hmm. they're going to attempt to change the Constitution so that no matter how much elected officials sympathize with the needs and the demands of the majority of us, um, or how concerned they are with getting reelected, they're they are literally not going to be able, even if they wanted to, to respond to us. the The corporate libertarians call this a constitutional revolution. It means the end of representative government, right? They are absolutely trying to shackle democracy. And the frightening thing is they have already tried it. Um, I was really uh, excited to see that there are folks on this um, uh, uh, call from Chile. And in my book, in chapter 10 of my book, I showed that they've already tried this constitutional revolution strategy. Um, this figure that I wrote about, the only US Southerner to win the Nobel uh, Prize in Economic Sciences, James Buchanan, was invited to Chile by the Pinochet government in 1980 to advise on the Pinochet Constitution that they called the Constitution of Liberty. To make a long story short, it is that Constitution that had people out on the streets risking their lives, getting killed and getting blinded uh, um, in December and last year in, 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 in 2019, because that Constitution has so paralyzed democracy in Chile. The, the previous uh, president, Michelle Bachelet, said she couldn't get her hands around the economy. She said Chile needs a Constitution without locks and bolts. But those locks and bolts were exactly what the radical right wanted to put in so that people couldn't reverse what the di uh, dictatorship did. And that worked for them so well in Chile, they want to bring that to America. So they're absolutely trying to do that. And while we have a tendency to focus on good celebrities like President Obama, if we like them, or bad celebrities like Donald Trump, if we don't, we focus so much on the personalities, we can miss what's going on. And while we've all been focused on Donald Trump, the radical right through the American Legislative Exchange Council and these state governments they've taken control of have lined up 28 of the 34 states needed to call a constitutional convention. So on that point, though, I do want to say it's very serious. They aim to roll back the 20th century, literally. Um, but people can go to Common Causes website. They have great information you know, on this issue, um, and, and they can get some more information on that and see if any of the measures are pending in their states. Let's assume best case scenario. Let's assume 
that we, the Democrats, the progressives win the White House and the Senate. And that the people who get elected understand the mm -hmm. critical issue of, or the mother of all issues is the climate crisis. Um, we see a movement um, that's in line with what science demands. Um, well, the, you know, the, there's, a, there's, there's a thing called the president's 10 bold actions for the first 10 days, which outline what the president can do for climate without even going to Congress. Um, uh, the beginning of what needs to happen uh, to address the climate crisis. What else needs to happen early on? What does the new administration need to do? And, and what do we need to be most careful of? In other words, even if we have a majority, what can they do that we need to be watchful of? Yeah, I think that's such an important question, uh, Jane, because we'll all come to this, and especially in the wake of the COVID crisis, with policy agendas that we want to see happen. But I think through this all, we need to remember what one of the characters in my book recommended to the political right. And that is, he told them, he said, if you don't like the outcome of public policy over a long period of time, stop focusing on who rules and start paying attention to the rules. And I think that we need to learn from that to realize what are the rules that have been blocking progressive goals for a few decades now, even though the majority of the population is on our side on issue after issue, including action on the climate. So we need to focus uh, laser-like on unrigging the rules that have been so systematically rigged in favor of fossil fuel corporations, other corporations, corporations, wealthy taxpayers, et cetera. Uh, and above all, I think we need structural democracy reform. So actually, the Democrats in the House, um, when they gained control of the House in 2008, they passed unanimously among Democrats um, House Bill 1, which is a great structural democracy reform package, a real promissory note on what we need. It's anti-corruption, it's transparency, it's sunshine, and it has um, uh, measures for automatic voter registration, early voting, mail-in voting, all those things we're seeing the importance of here. Why is that so important? I don't understand why pro-democracy groups don't shout this from the housetops. The United States, the first modern representative government based on we the people, you know where we stand now in the world, in democracies, where? In participation? Where? We're 138th out of 172. It is appalling, right? It is, it is unconscionable. I feel like if people knew that, they would never expect, accept that from their high school little league team, you know, or, you know, their kids little, like, we have got to realize we got to fix this thing. And I think no one has said it better than uh, Annie Leonard's um, of Greenpeace, who said, we have realized we will never get a healthy environment without a healthy democracy. So no matter who we are, no matter what issue is closest to our hearts, no matter what our passion is, we are all in this together in that if we don't have a functioning, open, transparent, effective government, we'll never achieve the goals we want. So we've got to keep that structural democracy reform uh, front and center as we go into this, this hopefully a period of a, a democratic administration and, and, con and, and Senate after this crisis. So uh, for my last question, before we go to audience questions, let's move from governments to movements. Mm -hmm. You've studied movements. Given your understanding of what the climate movement wants, how do you think we will actually all movements can best move forward? What should we all be doing? Well, first of all, I want to applaud you on what you're already doing, um, because I think it's so important. I think the embrace of environmental justice um, uh, in recent years from uh, folks in the, the environmental world has been hugely important. I think standing behind something like the Green New Deal that connects people across uh, issues and needs, um, that talks about the importance of good green jobs, as well as uh, pr preserving our, our, our planet and wilderness and species, all of that is movement in the right direction. Um, other things I guess I would say that I've realized in the wake of, of writing Democracy in Chains is that we have to 
uh, begin to develop a progressive long game of our own. The right has been thinking, you know, I realized, learned that through my research, they have been working for decades to bring us to the point where we are now. This is systematic strategy, integrated organizations, laying the right, uh, getting the right policies to lock things in place and the right laws and changes to constitutional uh, understanding. So we too have to play a long game. We've got to stop just focusing on one election cycle to the next or winning one local reform or state reform, those things are important. But if we don't connect them into a larger fight that involves all of us and internationally, we're not going to get where we need to go. I think to do that, to develop an effective long game that has the people who need to be at the table at the table and everybody, you know, in a truly inclusive way, we've got to break down the silos that have divided the left yeah. for so long. You know, you can be passionate about a particular area, whether it's healthcare or jobs or environment or discrimination or reproductive rights. We all have our passions and our talents, but we've got to see that we're connected in this. We have got to see that we all need that functional, working, robust, inclusive democracy to make any of our plans uh, come together. And I think this COVID crisis is really driving home the importance of uh, really an ecological understanding of how the world works. Like, you know, as Dr. King said, we are all connected in an inescapable garment of destiny. We see that now more than ever. It, you know, if the grocery workers are not protected, if the EMTs don't have the equipment they need, if our nurses are falling because our government is so broken, we are all in trouble. So I think out of this moment can come uh, some amazing uh, amazing new organizing and effectiveness. But to do that, I think we have to do a few more things. We have to keep mindful. I think we all made a big mistake when President Obama was elected. We said, whew, that was a lot of work. <laughs> you know, okay, we're tired. We're going to go back to life. And, and just left him to be the first one in the fan with this right-wing cause. We can't do that again. We have got to stay organized. As some people say, we've got to practice democracy beyond elections. We've got to keep the momentum going. We have to win back those states that we lost. There are 30 Republican-controlled states now. That is a noose on progressive policy nationally. We have got to organize everywhere, organize in rural areas, hold people accountable, and stay in control of the narrative. This COVID virus is a chance to change the public narrative about government and about corporate power and about you know whether we're in this together or whether you're on your own. It's an opportunity to change the national narrative as I've never seen in my lifetime, uh, probably more than like go going back to the Depression or World War II. We have got to gain control of this narrative and not let it go and push through the things that will bring us together and enable us to be the planet that we should be. And do, do you think that um, if a moderate gets elected to, to, to the presidency, um, that popular will can still prevail? Uh, yes, I do, because all elected officials have to answer to their constituents. And if constituents mobilize and organize and keep the pressure on, moderates can become radicals. We saw that with Abraham Lincoln in the Civil War. Abraham Lincoln was really, you know, he's anti-slavery, but he was a moderate. He wasn't an abolitionist, but it was like the logic of war, the pressure of abolitionists, the, 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 the eloquence and the organizing of people like Frederick Douglass and Wendell Phillips and all the great uh, abolitionists who made that change with the Roosevelt administration. Roosevelt in 1932, his platform had a balanced budget. <laughs> But he was pushed to the left by huge mobilizations of workers, of senior citizens calling for social security, of people around the country, LBJ, the same kind of thing. So yes, I think in a way, this may sound perverse, but for the people who are, are disappointed that neither Elizabeth Warren nor Bernie Sanders um, uh, is, is still uh, in the running, I think one thing that we can take is nobody's going to go to sleep. I don't think, under yes. a Biden presidency, right? Like people will right. still immobilize, we'll see the need to organize and to pressure and push um, and to not lose our own narrative. So, so I do see this, this is clearly a time of breakdown when we've, we're seeing just how bad the breakdown of our society and our institutions and, and our relationships to one another um, and our care for one another have been. But this could also be a time of breakthrough, a time of tremendous positive change if we seize it and if we organize and if we change the narrative. So I actually, you know, it's frightening and it's depressing on some days when you can't see anybody, you can't do anything. But but I do think we have it in our power to uh, to turn this thing around. 
Nancy, I love you so much. Are we ready to go to the, should we take audience questions? Sam? I think we're ready to take some audience questions if you all are. Yep. Wonderful. Um, well, uh, Nancy, this one comes from Twitter. It's from um, user Force, of, Force for Good. Um, they're asking about how we can work together to make environmental issues particularly, but um, of course many of the other issues that y'all have been talking about in this call, uh, how can we paint them in a nonpartisan light? How can we reach across the aisle? Um, talked a lot about intersectional organizing, organizing in places that the left traditionally hasn't been organizing is. Um, what are some ways that we can frame these issues to make them a nonpartisan issue uh, so that people don't just have the immediate, oh, that's a Republican talking point or that's Democratic talking point um, for moving yeah, forward? That's, that's that's a really significant question, uh, and it's all the more important because this radical right with this integrated strategy, they rely on Fox News and Breitbart and others that spew disinformation, keep us divided, and have made uh, about a third of the country think that the rest of us don't hate them, disrespect them, want to do bad things. So, so we've got to get out of that, right? And so we've even seen that they've made the phrase climate change toxic to many grassroots people who will vote Republican. But others have shown that there's ways around this. For example, there are people who are doing rural organizing or working with farmers who are talking about extreme weather. You know, the more concrete you get, the less partisan it is. So if you talk about drought or you talk about about, you know, uh, uh, land being ruined by, by what's happening, or you talk about, you know, on the coast, extreme weather and hurricanes, you can begin to break through. So I think, you know, that's just one example. Another thing I think that we could point to is um, what's happening to water quality in so many places. And I didn't talk about this um, uh, earlier, I meant to, but one example of what happens when this uh, co-libertarian cause gets power is Flint Michigan, what happened to their water supply? That was not an accident. That was a community that was put under an emergency manager program recommended by the Koch funded Mackinac Center in Michigan to take democratic power from local communities and put in emergency managers to cut costs. So the emergency manager over Flint redirected the water supply to a polluted river and ended up with a horrific crisis that we all know that lasted for 18 months. So again, things like water quality are important and it's not just urban communities like Flint where it's happening, but it's also happening in rural places between the combination of fracking and of deregulation. So, you know, getting out there and talking to people whose water is, is bad uh, is, uh, is, is another kind of thing that we could do. I think healthcare is a huge issue. You know, in 2018, there was an incredible mobilization on the progressive side and the issue in the lead was the concrete issue was health care that matters to so many people um, and will in this COVID crisis. We have, again, you know, looking at where we are now as a country, you know, the only advanced country without health uh, insurance for everyone, we have 160 million people who depend on their employment for their health care all of whom could lose that health care in a recession. We have got to fix this broken system. So those are just some examples, I think, of a way to talk to people concretely uh, in ways that avoid uh, partisanship. Actually, another one is gerrymandering. Michigan had an amazing gerrymandering uh, initiative, popularly led with 17,000 volunteers. You can read about it in David Daly's brilliant book, Unrigged, um, that, uh, that, that was led by um, people across um, political boundaries, but they all realized that if politicians were choosing their voters rather than voters choosing their politicians, we are all in the soup. Next question. Um, another one comes from a uh, individual from Twitter. Um, they're asking about third party voting. And I would be very curious to hear what y'all think about that in the current state of things. Um, and if you think that that is given the way that our government's structured, the way our electoral process is structured, uh, just kind of eat some of your thoughts about um, the benefits of, of having third party candidates in a race um, and then the efficacy of it. having them as well. Yeah. Jane, do you want to say anything about that or? No, it's, I, I, you, you. 
Okay, so um, so I actually think, I mean, I study the history of American uh, social movements and I teach it. Um, unfortunately, the way our country is set up is very hard to have effective third parties, but third parties, um, you know, historically have sometimes changed the conversation in interesting and important ways. I think one thing that has been uh, effective in our country is um, uh, fusion parties where you can run, um, uh, you know, you can put pressure on a Democrat by being, say, from the Working Families Party in New York or back, you know, Reverend Barber likes to talk about the fusion politics in North Carolina at the turn of the century. So that's a good strategy. But I think another thing is holding incumbents accountable. Um, and certainly Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and uh, many of the other uh, amazing figures who were elected in 2018 did that. And for people, by the way, who haven't seen this, um, the, the documentary that was produced about that, I believe it's called... Um, uh, bringing down the house, bring down the house. Uh, it's fantastic and so inspiring for this moment where outsider candidates with a vision who weren't beholden to corporations or to large donors, you know, just put the sneakers on and did the door knocking and did everything they needed to do and really um, grabbed some power. So I think, I think we do, um, we're kind of stuck with our two party system, but I think we could make it a lot more functional than we do if we had reforms like ranked choice voting and other things like that. Next question. Um, this one is from uh, Nancy in, um, in Wisconsin. Why do voters keep choosing the same folks who do not represent their interests? Uh, Nancy, we're the last of the Nancys. <laughs> None of us under 50 or 60. Uh, well, uh, we could say that in different ways. I mean, incumbency does have a power, if not challenged, uh, on either side of the aisle. Um, I think we also have to realize that people can define their interest um, differently than we might, and that's why I think it was, um, frankly, strategic genius if utterly um, uh, appalling the way that the corporate right has allied with the religious right in order to reach voters that they otherwise couldn't get to the polls. Um, so I think that's been a very significant thing. I mean, right now, uh, President Trump's most loyal constituency is white evangelical uh, believers. Um, so those people do think they're voting their interests, but they're defining them differently <laughs> than you or I might. Um, but so I think breaking through that is important. I think exposing the way in which the corporate libertarian right is frankly using people. I mean, these voters don't know that the, the party they're supporting is wants to come after their social security, their Medicare, their water quality, you know, all of these other things. So I think um, we've got to, first of all, I think reach people who we can organize, who are, you know, kind of think concentric circles, people who are already close to us, but aren't in action, who could be mobilized, et cetera. But ultimately, I think we need to have some frank, and, but also respectful conversations with ordinary uh, Republican voters who have bought into this and don't understand that they're being used um, to hurt ultimately themselves and their, their children's world. Next question. Um, this one's for you, Jane. What are some things that, um, that we can start doing right now um, to take action? Well, I think as we've been saying um, on Fire Drill Fridays for a while now, calling people in Congress mm -hmm. and if one person does it, it doesn't matter. But when large numbers of people start calling in and we're going to try to organize call-ins where we literally crash their phone lines, it matters. When they hear from tens and hundreds, even thousands of people saying, we don't want you to bail out the fossil fuel industry, we want you to protect and, and give money to small businesses, including solar and wind. We want you to also protect workers in the clean energy sector. We, you know, laying the groundwork for a clean energy future and not locking us into a fossil fuel past is we think one of the most important things that we can do right now, call those officials. And you don't, it's obviously the most effective when you're calling your own elected official and if they happen to be Uh, looks like Jane may have paused for a sec. Okay. 
<laughs> uh, well, I think maybe I'll just take up. I, I, I could see where Jane was going with that thought while we wait to get her back. And as she said, calling your own elected official is the most important, whether or not, you know, they're your party. But if they're in your state or your community, um, they, they, they will pay the most attention to phone calls from their voters. And also, uh, those phone calls are much more weighty in moving them to action than signing petitions or than sending letters even so, um, or form letters, I should say. So as Jane said, make those phone calls. Next question. Great. And then the next one's around voter suppression. Um, so wondering, folks are wondering ways that we can combat that uh, in an organized manner. Yeah, it's so important. And we just saw in Wisconsin that literally the other side is willing to risk people's lives to stay in power. That is really, really something uh, extraordinary. And the fact that they ran that election while people were under a stay at home order meant that only 3% of the electorate turned out in Milwaukee, one of the, you know, the largest city in, in Wisconsin and certainly one that has a large population of, of people of color. So those people's votes were taken away by that. So we have got to insist um, and got to get our representatives to insist that the stimulus uh, packages include protections for voting, include the ability to do online uh, voting, include the uh, early voting, whatever we need to make sure that this election can be representative. And you may have heard that uh, President Trump actually said when Nancy Pelosi wanted to put in some of these measures, he's candid. He says, well, if we do some of the things they talked about, Republicans would never get elected. He actually said these words. Um, so, so that's the kind of thinking that's out there on the other side. So we've just got to make absolutely sure that at the federal level this is happening, but also within our states, as Jane was talking about calling legislators about other things, we've got to be calling our state legislators to say, this is not acceptable. We are not going to do what Wisconsin did. Get on this now and make sure that every vote can be counted. And now we've got to figure out how to mobilize people when we have distance between us. But I, there's a lot of resourcefulness on our side. I think we will figure that out. Next question. Awesome. Um, this is from the, uh, the, the chat. Um, you both mentioned that the right sees the narrative around the role of government, around money and politics, around climate science, uh, more effectively than progressives. Um, what does your research su suggest, Nancy, that progressives do differently? Um, do we need to wage those narrative battles to the right over meaning of the Green New Deal, for exam example, or forge a separate path? Uh, so, um, uh, you know, I was very persuaded and still am by George Lakoff's little book years ago, Don't Think Like an Elephant. I think every progressive should read it uh, because what he points out is that the right for years has led from their values with a kind of coherent narrative. On our side, what often happens is people just start listing policies. And as he points out, people don't know what, want to know what policies you're for until they know if they trust you, right? Until they know that you share their values. So he's it's, it's got some really instructive uh, media advice in there that I think people could learn from. But I think, yes, absolutely, we must uh, take uh, this moment to begin to change the narrative about government um, and re help people remember that it's government that achieved some of the most important things in our history. Emancipation would never have happened without the federal government intervening in the states. Public health in the progressive era, workers' rights, retirement security, civil rights, action on the environment, all of those things we need. And so we have to look uh, back to that. I'm actually part of um, a group that's called, they're calling it the big rethink, but trying to uh, come together and bring people together to begin to understand how to change this framing that's been so destructive to us and help us get um, the new framing that we need. So I'm glad that someone raised that issue. Next question. Um, we uh, questioned about uh, Trump's recent rollbacks, the EPA protections by executive order, um, and what we can be doing to combat that. Yeah, um, Jane, uh, I know you had Naomi Klein um, in one of the earlier Fire Drill Fridays, and I think so many of us now are thinking about her phrase, the shock doctrine, not just her phrase, but the concept that was um, embedded in her very powerful book of that title. And we're seeing now in a quite dramatic form how the political right and corporations will use a moment like this in order to push through agendas they've had built up over the years. So I think what we all need to do is be connected 
connected with organizations that represent the issues that we care about, you know, whether it's Greenpeace or, or other kinds um, of groups and make sure we know what's happening. And then we need to engage in what some people are calling regulatory activism. And that means, as Jane said, making those phone calls, showing them or watching them, they're not getting away with this, but also weighing in on comment, uh, uh, comment periods for agencies and beginning to try to shift the dialogue. And, you know, you can think that that's not effective, but um, probably hardly anybody really remembers Scott Pruitt anymore. Remember that name? <laughs> he was exposed so effectively by uh, Greenpeace activists and others in the environmental movement that he finally got kicked out the door. So I think this kind of thing really does matter. Bringing sunshine, you know, as the old expression goes, is the best disinfectant. So the more we can expose what's being done, uh, the better that we can fight it uh, and the better that we can help other people understand why we have to change who's in power and change these rules in order to get to the society we want and need. Mm -hmm. Next question, Sam. Great. Um, we have another one from the chat. Um, the corona coronavirus pandemic has basically exploded the argument for conservative uh, libertarianism. How are you seeing libertarians defend their ideology right now? Um, how can progressives pandemic response expose that corporate agenda for what it is at this moment? Yes. Um, somebody said early on in this, there's no libertarians in a pandemic. Um, and I think that's certainly true for ordinary people. I mean, nobody wants to lose their jobs. Nobody wants to get infected. Everybody is looking to government to do something. But I think what we're seeing now is that's true of ordinary people, that these ideas are being exposed as literally dead, deadly dogma. That's how I think of these libertarian ideas now. This is a deadly dogma. Um, but for the people who have interests in these ideas, like the Coke industries, the fossil fuel industries that they are connected to, all these other uh, corporations with, with destructive ideas, they are doubling down. They're kind of staying out of the limelight now, but you can see, you know, they complain. I, I get their mailings, you know, they complain to their own people, they're continuing to go on. And on the far fringes, you see some of the nuttier applications of libertarian ideas. So, um, uh, in um, Oregon, the people who occupy the Mallow Reserve, um, the, the property rights supremacists are saying, they're actually having meetings now and saying that this is a violation of their liberty to be told to stay home, that it's a violation of the constitution and they want to hold meetings and they want to defy the government. And we've seen that there's government um, officials like that, like the governor of Mississippi, who is going to preempt the uh, cities, urban areas that were implementing sane uh, stay-at-home measures. So this really is a time, I think, when we can also expose how pernicious this libertarian ideology is, because frankly, it defies nature and it defies the best in every religious tradition, which all say we are in this together. We need one another. We must care for each other. I'm, I'm going like this. I'm not actually a religious person, but I respect um, those the best in those traditions. And they all say we have to care for one another. We have to look out for the poor. We have to care for the sick, welcome the stranger. This is a time to reclaim the values that could unite us and, and, and get rid of this, this pernicious set of ideas. Great. Um, so on the thread of the Koch brothers, um, if, if they didn't exist, would another version of them pop up? Um, and what kind of regulatory measures could we take to prevent their influence in the future? Uh, good question. Um, I think that certainly there would be self-seeking corporations and especially fossil fuel uh, corporations uh, without the Koch network. But actually, I think this ideology has mattered a great deal. Um, Charles Koch has been into these ideas since he was a child, uh, you know, and a young man in the, the 50s and the 1960s, and has played a very important, you know, I, I oppose it. Um, I, I think it's it's been absolutely toxic to, to our society and to the wider world. But, but there is a commitment there and a dedication that, um, uh, that I recognize um, and he has played a leadership role in convening corporations to believe in self-interest as libertarians would uh, define it. And without that, I do think that they would be the cacophonous way they always were. So there's actually, there's some good books about um, uh, corporate lobbying in the 1980s and 1990s. And they showed how corporations only stay together for a very short time because most of them are thinking about their own bottom line. They don't actually, even though we think they think like a class, 
class. They don't usually think that way. Um, but what Coke has done has, is to provide this unity to show them how they can all get their own, you know, nests feathered by what he's what what he and this network are doing. Um, so I think that role has been hugely important, and we need to understand it in order to be able to uh, be effective in defeating it. Next question. Great. Um, so switching gears really quick, are you concerned about what we just saw with Wisconsin and in the Supreme Court and how could this play out in November? Yes, yeah. Um, there was a time when folks on the progressive side, you know, would look to courts as the, you know, place of last resort where, you know, good things came from the courts in terms of, you know, uh, ultimate, you know, in the earlier years, some workers' rights, certainly civil rights, some women's rights, environmental protections, that's really changed. And one element of that long game on the right has been a uh, very strategic emphasis on changing the judiciary, changing law schools, and changing understanding of the Constitution. Charles Koch himself boasts that he, he provided seed money for the Federalist Society, that five to four majority on our courts, they're all Federalist Society members. Um, we could go deep in the weeds on this, but that has been extremely effective on the right. Uh, also comes out of something many have, have probably heard of, the Powell Memorandum that talked about the need for corporate mobilization to change the conversation and change the courts. That's a big deal. Um, and that's a place where progressives really drop the ball. So I think there are people who are trying to work on this now, who are trying to address it. Certainly there's the Brennan Center for Justice in New York, American Constitution Society, some other groups that are thinking about changing the courts and uh, developing a kind of progressive bench for the courts. But we're in deep trouble uh, with the Supreme Court as it stands. And that's why some people are saying that a new president should maybe pay Mitch McConnell back and add two seats to the court to overrule those ill-gotten seats. You know, now I don't know, as a historian, I can see a downside with that too, but I think we've got to broaden the conversation because the courts now are operating uh, so clearly as a flank of this right wing, the Supreme Court, I should say, is ap operating as a flank of this right wing movement in the way that uh, Justice Ginsburg um, and uh, Justice Sotomayor, among others, have pointed out. So, uh, so we've got to think about what to do about the courts in a long game strategy. Okay, we have a few more minutes. So could you tell us where the question comes from and who's asking it? Oh, yes, sorry. Um, there's a, a lot coming in. So this one's from William uh, in the chat. Um, in looking at the fact that Republicans across the board deny that climate change is real, uh, do you think that most of them really believe that? Or is that a position that they've taken that is purely power oriented in nature? Yeah, a really important question. It's it's hard to believe that they can actually believe this, but I also don't understand how some of them can get up and look at themselves in the mirror in the morning, frankly, while carrying water for this agenda. Um, not a lot of heroes in that party. What I will say, though, is that they have come under tremendous pressure uh, from a pincers operation organized by this Koch-funded radical right. That pincers operation includes the threat of primary challenges from below if they don't toe the line, including on the climate tax pledge that Mike Pence was so instrumental in pushing, Vice President Mike Pence. Um, so the threat of, of primary challenges from below, but those primary challenges from below would go nowhere without the dark money donor or funding that makes them effective. So we have seen this time and again, where Republicans who followed their um, consciences and uh, the science and tried to recognize and act on climate change were knocked out in donor funded primary challenges. So again, until we can shine sunlight on that dark money and expose what they're doing, I don't see how we create breathing room for Republicans who want to do the right thing. One more question. Oh, can I say one thing though? Just in case any of them happen to be listening. <laughs> they should tell us what they know. I mean, there are Republicans leaving Congress in droves now, right? And state legislatures, many of them are sick of it, but they're, they're not, you know, they're not sharing with the people what they've seen and why they got sick of it. So I think we could also hold them accountable and start asking questions like, well, if you did say that you believe the scientists on climate change, what might happen to you? <laughs> that would be a good question for the media to ask. Yeah, good point. 
Sam? Great. Um, and then uh, just one last question from the chat. Um, this one's from Alex. Um, uh, they're asking, um, what is just some uh, general wisdom uh, that you can provide for uh, anybody that's looking to take action, um, you know, this week or, or right now, just to kind of close us out? What are some, some final words that you have for supporters looking to, to act right now? Uh, well, I'd say a couple things. One of them is uh, the single most important finding of my research is that this Koch network uh, of organizations has adopted the strategy it has because they understand that they are a permanent minority, that the people do not want this world they're trying to be bring into being. No one wants to live in a world without public schools, without Social Security, without Medicare, without environmental protection. That's why they're using stealth. That's why they're using tactics like voter suppression, et cetera. So a crucial thing that we can do is share with people the truth of what this cause is about, right? And spread sunshine as, again, that best disinfectant, help people know what's happening and how this will affect their lives. Um, from that, I think we can also say that if everyone on this call, I mean, I know many of you are already active and that's why you're on this call and how you knew about it, but perhaps for people who are getting involved for the first time, if everyone on this call thought for a moment about their own worlds and did a little inventory, who do I know? Who's in my networks? What organizations do I belong to? Am I in a congregation? Am I in an alumni group? How can I reach others and get them more involved? And then also think, who am I? What, what are my skills? What are my passions? What are my talents? What could I bring to a movement? Think about that and then get involved. Um, a lot of you are on a call for Greenpeace. So join Greenpeace and ask Greenpeace how, how you could help uh, Greenpeace. But maybe if it's something else or you have another skill set or something that's happening in your local community, do that. But I truly believe if all of us who are concerned about the direction of our country began to become active and to share that concern with the people that we love and the people that we know we would be able to turn this thing around um so that's how movements are built one by one by one until those numbers so multiply that you get a transformation so so we can get there but to get there we all have to take responsibility for our piece of this and jane i think probably has other ideas about direct things you can well, do I, with I, uh, just to, to can i be heard yes this shows my incompetence <laughs> um my next week, um, my guest is going to be Christiana Figueres, who was the negotiator of the Paris Climate Treaty. And she reminded me that very serious research has shown that if we can get 3.5% of the population to become active, to become involved in nonviolent protest, we will win. Mm -hmm. Any movement that has 3.5% of its population wins. Now that means 11 million people in the United States, but if we work hard, and as you just said, Nancy, talk to our friends, talk to our neighbors, talk to our colleagues at work about this, encourage them to read Nancy's book, Democracy in Chains, The Deep History of the Radical Rights Stealth Plan for America. This book will really give you weapons. It will weaponize your understanding of how to persuade people that what is being attempted, although it looks it's playing to the white working class in the middle of the country, this will undo everything that creates the American dream. So try reading this, Democracy in Chains. Nancy McLean's book. Nancy, thank you from the bottom of my heart for being in this Fire Drill Fridays with us. I have seen in the chat people saying this is the best web webinar ever. <laughs> so I have you to thank for that and I'm so oh, grateful. And I Jane, want to I remind so people. Grateful to you. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I'm just so grateful to you for your commitment and inspiration and to all these people who signed on this call. I can't wait to read the chat because it looks really, really interesting. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, me too. Friends. And I'm sorry that we can't answer all the questions. Um, but know that all of our uh, Fire Drill Fridays are um, archived on our website. So you can watch or have your friends watch this um, this event today by going to our website, firedrillfridays.com. 
And if you want to join us, Fire Drill Fridays, which is a project of Greenpeace, join us and make your voice heard and know what you can do. You can text Jane to 877-877. That's Jane to 877-877. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you again, Nancy McLean. We'll see you next Friday. See you next time. Goodbye. Keep up the fight. Stay safe. Take care. Thank you so much.